good evening. It's good to see everybody this evening. Let's all stand together as we join in and sing our call to worship, Majesty. It was so good to see Brother Tony Gorley back in church uh, this morning. What a blessing. You slipped your spirits to see the hand of God. There's a prayer request he has, and I'm going to share it with you. It's concerning his job. The job he had before he you know, contracted COVID was a job really uh, working through a warehouse, and he was constantly gathering parts, getting everything together uh, for the customers and whatnot. And that warehouse is extremely hot. Extremely hot. First, you could see that the mobility is not there and will not be for a while. And the, the extreme heat, because of the COVID, he has had trouble respiratory and cannot work in that condition like that. So it, just be praying. He's had, he has a lot of years in there, in, in that uh, working there. So he has a lot of things built up that really are beneficial to him and to his family. And just praying that the Lord would move them into maybe another area with the company where he could keep his benefits and be able to work that way as well. Just so I pray lift up with him. God, raise him up off of a, a bed that nobody believed he would raise up off of with COVID, then God can get him a, get somebody's heart to move him to another job. Father, we thank you today. It has been a good day, Lord. We have once again enjoyed your word. Thank you, Lord, for the answer to the prayers of many, for Tony, for others, Lord, that we've mentioned even this morning. So good to see the baby girl, Madeline Blake, doing well. We pray, Lord, you just continue to give them wisdom in the rearing of this little baby girl. We pray for health and strength for them each. And then, Lord, we thank you for the services here and for those who gather tonight. Lord, I pray you just speak to our hearts. Remind us of of who Christ is in our life. Remind him of what we have in Christ and the joys and the blessings that are before us as his children one day to be forevermore with him. Now, God, Lord, we thank you again. I ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A couple of announcements remind you tomorrow morning, young at heart, our senior citizens begin meeting again at 1030, fellowship room, same place we did uh, Come in the back door, just turn left. Uh, really, that's the only door that's unlocked, isn't it? Uh, we just don't want other, just anybody wandering in. So we, we security guards watch you coming in, I guess. But no, we want you to come, fellowship together. We'll do the same thing. We should have you out by, oh, 1215, 1220. So if you have some place to be, somewhere to go uh, that you need to get there at a certain time frame, we will we'll honor that and be respectful of your time and not try to drag it out on you as well. So keep that in mind, if you will. Then on sep Sunday, September the 12th, uh, again, Dr. Roger Baker being with us, morning services, both Sunday school and morning worship, and then in the evening service. And then following that, we have a fellowship plan, homemade ice cream and hot dogs, and I want you to stick around for that and enjoy the time together. I am thoroughly enjoying now that uh, so much of this, a lot of that COVID I was behind us before this new variant started. I uh, no telling what they're going to say about it, but that... I'm glad to see that we're getting to get, have fellowship started again, spending time with one another. Uh, I was 
uh, I don't remember now which one it was now. We were at there, and I was just sitting there, and somebody said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just enjoying hearing people talk and laugh again. And uh, I'm looking forward to the young at heart as well. Good day. Good to see you, buddy. You can remain seated, but let's sing together. Count your blessings. tonight at during choir practice I gave the choir members their Christmas music I know that you say what it's just August but it'll be here before we know it and the reason I'm announcing that if you're not part of the choir but you'd like to be part of the drama portion um, just think about it I'll need several adults I think three adults and uh, one teenager and then a couple of kids as well but uh, just think about it and I'll let you know next week what those parts are going to be and you pray about it if you'd like to be a part of it we cer certainly could use you and uh, that would be a blessing let's go ahead and sing out stand up stand up for Jesus <clears throat> Yeah. 
standing as we sing day by day as our special congregational tonight. sing the next two verses, 299, day by day. Every day the Lord himself is near me. Tonight in the book of First John, I have a question for you before you get started. When the words weren't on the screen, what were y'all singing? <laughs> Almost everybody was moving their mouth. First John, chapter 5. There are sureties that I desire in my life. Things that I do not have to worry about someone changing or being changed. I visit a, I go to a, my doctor's appointment and the doctor gave me my physical and says, well, this is the area that you need some help in, work in need to pay attention to these areas here, but by and large, you're, you're physically okay. Your heart's not bad. Your lungs are clear. and you, Everything seems to be okay. And I appreciate that hearing from a man that I respect enough to believe that he knows what he's talking about. And so I take it as a, as a surety, and I know he can be wrong. I do that. But there are sureties that I, I need in my life. I need certain things to be... Uh, unchanging. I, I joke with Brenda a lot of times, there's one surety that I can count on each week, each each day. If I come home late in the afternoon and I say, Brenda, don't cook, let's go eat. 
there's a surety she's going to say okay with that. We're going to go out. And uh, that's just the way it is. But there are sureties that the Word of God gives us that we need in order to, to, to stand upon. And not only to stand upon, but to grow from. In other words, we're, here's the starting point, the surety. And here's where we start. Now, from that point on, we need to grow spiritually and in maturity. And if you have sureties that you can always come back to, things that you can always come back to, you'll never find yourself lost in your Christian life. Because you've always got a, a standard, a, something that's steadfast, not changing. And I want to look tonight at some of those sureties that we find in the Word of God. And I've noticed something that we live in a, a culture that, that wants to diss anything that, that we say is, is sure or dogmatic. They just simply do not want to accept that premise. In our political climate, climate they, things that are not Nothing dogmatic. Everything is constantly changing. There's very little tolerance for that which we say is not changing in our society today. And we have more and more knowledge, but yet we have less and less sureties, it seems. Well, John, as he's writing in 1 John, he uses a little word that you know, it's the word no. To point out to us some sureties in our life. Things that when things are not going as we think they ought to, we can rush back to and start again. That's a starting place. That's a surety. Let me look at a couple of them with me. Look at chapter 2. Look at verse 3. And hereby we do know, there's that word, know, that we know him if we keep his commandments. There's a surety. Look at the third chapter, verse 14. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. There is a surety. Look at the fifth chapter, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and we keep his commandments, there is a surety. So there are just three of the sureties. But tonight I want to look at five of the sureties in the fifth chapter that John gives us. He prints five truths and he says, you can know these things. They're sureties in your life. Beginning in verse 11, he says, and this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that not, not, hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And we know that he hear us whatsoever we should ask. We know that we have the petition that we desire of him. If any man see his brother or sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. Now, the first certainty, or the surety, really, is what I'm, term I prefer to use, the first surety I have is the surety of the new birth experience. Look at verse 11 again. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath light. He that hath not the Son of God hath not light. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. 
A belief. What belief? Verse 13 says that belief on the name of the Son of God. A belief that leads to the new birth experience, which will change our behavior forever. We will grow from that point on spiritually. You see, my, I believe one of the greatest joys that you have probably ever had and one of the greatest joys that you could ever have is to lead somebody else to Christ. It may be one of your children. It may be a spouse. It may be a neighbor, a friend, or a co-worker. It doesn't make any difference. But to lead somebody to Christ, to see birth. I'll tell you, when Madison Blake, when first Madison, of course, worked, he was helping us here in the school ministry and uh, doing things for us. And when we found out she was expecting, we were excited for her. And then they lost a child. And uh, it grieved me even to hear about that. I, I, that bothers me, always has. But then she found out she's expecting again. And she was doing everything the doctor said, and she did the first time as well, but everything to, to bring the birth of that new baby girl. The baby was born on Friday afternoon, late Friday night. My phone beeped that little sound it makes when somebody sends an email and says, I, we have a baby girl. And I rejoiced over that. There's something about birth. And if you enjoy the birth, the natural birth of a child, you're really going to love the spiritual birth of a believer. Because that means they're eternally secured here. There's a certainty of the new birth experience that we have there. Look what he says, verse 11. Eternal life is in the present possession of believers. He says in verse 12, if you have the Son, you have life. That's right now. And he's talking about spiritual life, eternal life, everlasting life that you have right now. He said in verse 11, it says that you have been given, hath given to you. In verse 12, it says you hath life. In verse 13, you have eternal life. There is a surety that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that you are born into the family of God by the new birth experience. I counted it. I took place in my life at 10 years of age. All of you in this auditorium had a particular time. I trust that you may not remember the date, but you probably have a distinctive memory about when or approximately time that you put your faith and trust in Christ at that time. The moment you did, you immediately received eternal life in Christ. Now, may I tell you something? You've always had eternal life, but not in Christ. Because there was a time before you received Christ, your personal Savior, eternal life, you would spend, eternal, you'd spend eternity in hell, separated from God. But when you got saved, that's when we use the word eternal life or everlasting life for the person who's born into the family of God. But you've always been an eternal being. You were going to exist somewhere for all time. Eternal life is also a future fact when you think about it. Because of the new birth, when you leave this world, you're going to live with Christ forever. The word there, eternal, has no ending. Now, the new birth had a beginning in your life. God has no beginning, no ending. As a child of God, you had a beginning as a child of God, but you'll never, never have an ending as a child of God. There's a surety of your salvation. It's present. You have it right now. But it's forever. It's going to be future. So salvation is present and future as well. And the only way to have that eternal life, he tells us in verse 12, is through the Son. Through the Son. Jesus said the same thing in John 14 and verse 6 when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. So there's a surety of the new birth experience. And John wants you to understand that Anytime when you put your faith and trust in Christ, you receive that new birth experience there. And the only way to have it is through the Son. And by the way, did you know that John wrote an entire book just so you would know this? Look over in John chapter 20, if you would. Just turn over to John, not 1 John. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Look what he says in verse 31. But these are written, what? This book, this whole book of St. John, are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that believing you might have life through his name. Do you know that's why so many times you find a little booklet, little form, little pocket booklet? It's the book of John. It's the book of John because a person reading through the book of John will get a clear picture of who Christ is and what he came to do and who they are and what they need to do. There's a surety, folks, of the new birth when you put your faith and trust in Christ. Well, look on with me if you would. Look at verse 14. And he says, and this is the confidence that we have, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. There is a surety of prayers being heard and prayers being answered. You saw evidence of that this morning here in the church services we saw Tony, as well as that little baby girl. He said, because I'm saved, because I've been born again, I have a confidence in prayer being heard. The word there, verse 14, confidence, means that I have a freedom to speak to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I can do so courageously. He says I'm to come to the throne of grace boldly with my request before him. You don't have to be shy. You don't have to hold back. He already knows everything you're thinking, you ever have thought and ever will think. So why be shy about it? Over in the book of Hebrews, listen to what he says in verse 10, chapter 10, verse 22. He says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Come, he says to the throne. You are invited to come into the very presence of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ to make your request made known to God there. Our assurance should lead us to approach the Almighty and ask. Let me tell you something, though. There's a key that we need to get a hold of when we talk about coming to the Lord with our prayers. It means we need to come with a submissive will. We see that in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, over in the book of Mark, chapter 14, when he said to his Lord, he said, Lord, it's not what I will, but it's what you will be done. We mentioned this other, I guess it was the other Sunday night or something that can't remember which of the services it was. But so many pray and ask God what the will of God is for them, but they don't pray with the desire to do the will of God, just but to know the will of God. Why would God give you and tell you what the will of God is for you and for you to do if you already made your mind up that you may not do it? God knows that. But when we come with a mind that is surrendered and yielded to the Lord to follow His will, no matter what it might be, God's will, he doesn't want it to be a secret to you. He doesn't want to play games with you. He'll reveal his will that we might know it as well there. Notice it says pray with confidence. But also, look at verse 16. If any man sees brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he pray for it. All unrighteous is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, I'm going to just be honest with you here. Those verses are kind of tough for me. Going through several commentaries of men that are godly men, good commentators here, guess what? They all saw something different. They weren't in agreement on what they saw there either. Uh, Daniel's awful happens quite a lot, doesn't it, in commentaries. But I do see what I believe he's saying here. I think he's having us to pray with compassion. I believe he's having to pray with a broken heart. You see, when our brother sins, it's not a time for delight. It's a time for intercession to bring him before the throne of grace. We're to intercede. We're not to gossip and not to judge and not to fault find them as here, but we're to intercede for them. Look at the third chapter, 1 John 3, verse 16. Look what he says. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Now watch. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You see, we can continually start praying. We are to continually start praying when we see someone straying, getting away from the will of God and walk of God. Listen to James real quick. Let me, James chapter 5. Look if you would at verse 19 if you're there already. Let me go ahead and read. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul. From death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Wow. He's saying here that you can, with your prayers, 
for an erring brother or sister in the Lord can bring about the saving of a, of a life, a direction they're going in there as well. Think about what happens when people pray. I, I think about sometimes things just right now. Imagine people becoming aware. When you start praying for somebody, imagine when people get, become aware of the emptiness, what they just don't have, what they're missing in their life. Where, or some big old tough guy, broken by his sins. My dad was preaching in a revival service one time up in a rural, very rural part of uh, the state. And I wasn't with him that night, but he was telling me about it later when he got home. But he got in, he, he was preaching in the service there, and there was one guy in the community. Every community has one guy. But their one guy was mean snake, like, almost like a snake, they said. And uh, they'd been inviting him, people had been inviting him all week. He finally got to where he was cussing people that came in because he said, I ain't coming to your church and we're cursing them and everything else. But they were there on the last night. And lo and behold, they came in. And somewhere in the service, Dad used to phrase something like this. There's not anybody that God cannot save. And he popped up in the pew and said, that's a lie. There is somebody God can't save. He can't save me. When the service ended, he was at the altar receiving Christ as his Savior. You see... We need to pray with compassion for people there. And look, if we start doing that, folks, we're going to start to see some big, tough guys break down and begin weeping for their souls. Husbands are going to begin to love their wives like God said to do so in the, the, Bible, the Bible. Wives are going to begin to respect their husbands. Kids are going to mutually honor their parents because that's the only way a child ought to be, honorful to their parents. Lost people being found, addicts setting free. Uh, boards, uh, excuse me, burdened souls being set free and finding rest for their souls there. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. This is a verse you ought to keep in your mind. Remember it carefully. More of rest for me. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord, watch, in ceasing to pray for you. I am sinning against God when I cease to pray for you, the Word of God says. So there ought to be a a surety, a prayer's heard, and prayer's answered that I've got in my life. Well, there's a thing. Look at verse 18 then. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touch him not. There ought to be a surety of overcoming in your life, that you are an overcomer, that sin will not beat you up and drag you down and keep you where you should not be. Now, there's a phrase there. Look at it again. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. The word there, really the thought ought to be translated for us, doth not continually practice sin. It means if your life is continually involved in the direction of sin, there's something just not right. It's just not right. You're not an overcomer. You don't have the Holy Spirit of God within you to enable you to be an overcomer. If you can't ever get, if you have no victory over sin, None whatsoever. You're not relying. You're trying to do it yourself. You're not going to accomplish it anyway. But the Holy Spirit of God is your source there that you can go to. You see, sin, once you become a child of God, should no longer taste sweet to you like it once did. The person who is saved cannot live in a lifestyle of sin and enjoy an intimate relationship with Christ at the same time. It's not possible. Sin and closeness with Christ are just not compatible. It's a matter, folks, it really is a matter of how we live. Because we are an example, a reflection of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and of the precious Holy Spirit of God who lives within us. Christ keeps you safe. Notice that word there in verse 18. The begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Christ keeps you safe. Christ keeps you safe. He prays for you. He protects you. You are his possession. He touches you not. Satan can't touch you. I one day was talking with a gentleman about the will of God. And I said, God has a will, perfect will for you. But God has a directive will and he has a permissive will. He has a directive will, something he wants you to do. He has a permissive will that he permits you to do. He said, well, what's the difference? I said, well, in the directive will of God... 
God will give you simple directions, point you and say, that's it. That's the only way you've got to go. That's where I want you to be. That's what I want you doing. But sometimes in God's permissive will, God will allow something to happen in your life to point you back to his directed will for your life as well. We have a responsibility, James tells us. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The fourth surety is is the surety of our heritage. Look at verse 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that we are of God. We are in God's family. I am heir with Christ. I join heir with Christ. God is my Father. And that took place when I got born into the family of God. And a person who is not saved is not, does not have God as their father. Satan is his father, the scripture teaches us. So many times we say we're all part of the family of God. Baloney. We are not all part of the family of God. Only those who have been born again by the shed blood of Jesus Christ are part of the family of God. The rest are outside of the family of God. And one day God will gather his church, and those outside of the family of God are not part of the church. They're under the control. Those who are not in the family of God are controlled the evil one. They do not have a heavenly father. A child of God, God is one who's been born again, one whose family is of God. And then there's the surety of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. If you look in verse 20, it says, We know that the Son of God has come. That verse begins with a reference to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Born of a virgin, manger scene. After his crucifixion ascended into heaven, one day he's coming again here. The Son of God has come and he's true. He is the true God. He is the Son of God. The one and only Son of God. He's not one of many of the sons of God. He is the Son of God as well. There are some that teach that Jesus is a created being. No. Jesus has always existed. He does not have a beginning. He'll not have an ending. He is part of the Godhead, the Trinity. He is God. 100% God. He has never ceased or never has had a beginning. He's genuine. He's authentic. I, I love that we've been giving understanding because of Jesus coming. And when he left, he said, I'm going to send someone to you. Holy Spirit of God, I'm going to send somebody to you that will remind you of everything that you heard and I'm going to give you understanding where you didn't have it before. Remember over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, the Word of God says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. I have a gentleman I worked for for almost six years in a grocery store. I respected him as my manager. He was. He was my manager. Uh, He trusted me in the store. I I had a key to the store half the time in my pocket. He'd go home, say, lock up the door. Or he'd close the door up and tell me to clean up and then go home. But he trusted me, and I trusted him. I respected him as a manager. But I remember one time him coming to me after I'd been in Bible college for a little while. He said, what do you think about that book of Revelation?" And I told him, I said, Mr. Wells, I try not to. (laughs) It's just over my head. He said, I believe the guy that wrote that was on LSD. I said, no, Mr. Wells, he wasn't on LSD. I said, he was writing down what God told him to write down. I said, there's a lot of it John didn't even understand what he was writing down at the time. We now see some things that John would not have seen and understand. But how is that possible? Well, you and I have the Spirit of God who will give illumination to the Word of God that we might see it and understand it now. So there is the surety of the divine nature of Jesus Christ and the responsibility we have and take upon ourselves is that we, according to the Word of God here, are to avoid idols, keep ourselves from them. You see, we are commanded to keep ourselves spiritually clean through the Lord. When we think of idols, we sometimes think of images of wood and clay and stone or whatever it is. But God speaks very clearly about that. Listen to what he says in Exodus. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is the earth beneath, or that in the water under the earth. God made it real simple here. Anything you focus your attention on above God is your idol, your worshiping. <clears throat> See, the worship of anything other than God causes spiritual, excuse me, <clears throat> separation from God and fellowship there as well. Not just in the old time, but today as well. You see, today, people make idols out of so many things. Their job becomes their idol. Their spouse becomes their idol. Their children become a recreation. There's so many things today that people focus their attention on to the point, and that is becomes the focal point of their life to the point of the exclusion of God. And they put this on the, mat, on the, on the throne, and God is removed from the throne. And God said, when you've done that, you've caused separation in the fellowship with me. See, God says that there are some certainties, some sureties that you and I need to keep in mind. First, the surety of the new birth, the surety of the, of the answered prayer, the hearing and the answering of prayer, the surety of us being overcomers because of the Holy Spirit that abides within us. There's the surety of our heritage because God is our Father, and there's the surety of the divine nature of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the true Son of God by which I have my sins forgiven and have been promised a home in heaven. Now, one of these days, and it may happen, it may have already happened, you're going to find yourself struggling with some things. I'm going to tell you this. Run to these sureties. Run to them. Get back in them and say, this is where I can start. I'm not going back to point zero. I'm, I'm already this far along. I don't know how many times I have taken 1 John 5, verse 13, to a saint that was saying to me, Pastor said, I just feel like I, I just, I'm not sure about my salvation. And I rushed to 1 first, to first John 5, verse 13. These things that you can know. What? That you've been born again if you put your faith and trust in the Son of God. I wake up sometimes, I don't feel saved. When I had COVID-19, I honestly I can't remember a whole lot, but I don't think I thought too much about salvation during that time. I woke up a couple of weeks ago and my head stopped up with allergies and couldn't breathe. and I didn't feel saved that morning either. But it didn't change, did it? It's a surety. Nothing changes that. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for your precious word. We ask your blessing upon us as we're dismissed to be up about your service. And Lord, sometimes when we find ourselves struggling in our spiritual life, we're imperfect beings. We make mistakes. We sin. Sometimes, Lord, we find ourselves in situations that we don't even know how we got there. But there's some things that we know for certain. And one is your child. I can rush into your presence and unload my burdens, confess my sins, and that fellowship can be restored again because of the surety of the new birth and the surety of prayers heard and answered. God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your many blessings to us. Lord, I pray as we begin another school year this week that Christ would be exalted. He'd be lifted up. We'd see some young people make decisions for all eternity. We pray some teachers would find within them, Lord, the strength in difficult days to stand before the classroom of kids and show forth Christ in their life, their attitude and their actions. Help us each and every one, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good day. May the Lord bless you.